here. Well, welcome everyone to this meeting of the Gardner Waterman chapter of Sabre. I'm Bruce McClure, pinch hitting for our chapter chair, Clayton Truder, who's going to be along very shortly. Tonight, we have Rob Nyer as our guest. Rob is a longtime baseball writer and editor for ESPN.com, SB Nation, and FoxSports.com. He began his career as a research assistant for groundbreaking baseball author Bill James and later worked for Stats Incorporated. He's also written or co-written several baseball books, including most recently with Dale Scott, The Umpire is Out, Calling the Game and Living My True Self. Rob is also the host of the exceptional podcast, Hi. Sabercast with Rob Nyer. And oh, by the way, he's also the commissioner of the West Coast Collegiate League, who announced an agreement with Major League Baseball to jointly pursue initiatives of mutual interest. Rob Nyer, my friend, it's an honor to have you in here this evening. And I'm going to start by asking you one question. You ready? Yep. What is your earliest baseball memory? I think it is playing wow. baseball with a tennis ball in the backyard of our across the street neighbors when I was eight years old. That's that's generally the first thing I can think of when I think about baseball. And then uh, later there was White Sox baseball on the radio when I was a little bit older. And then my first actual professional baseball game, 1976, when I was 10. Where was that? Where was that game? Chicago, Kansas City. Kansas City. That's right. You're. That's right. Okay. Yeah, we had we'd lived in um, Southern Michigan, which is where we heard the White Sox games. But then shortly after that season, we we moved to the Kansas City area. Well, wh why don't you tell us a little bit about your arc and your writing and and all that the the story of Rob. Well, gosh, uh, <laughs> I, it, it, I mean, if you'd asked me that 10, 15 years ago, I would have had maybe a simpler answer because I hadn't done nearly as much. But um, I'll, I'll try to come up with a, a, a thumbnail. Uh, I grew up beginning at the age of roughly 10, being sort of obsessed with baseball and Mostly that was being obsessed with the Kansas City Royals. When we moved there in 1976, they, they had been very competitive the year before. Uh, the Chiefs were not competitive by that point. The Royals had moved into a new stadium in 73. So there was just sort of this, all these things, things were being mixed up together. And it sort of created a general obsession in the Kansas City area with, 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 with the Royals. They, back then... It was a big deal for a team to draw two million fans in a season. Right now, it's not. Now that's sort of you don't do, get two. You're something's wrong. But in the '70s, when you had teams like the A's drawing less than a million, the Orioles less than, and these are good teams. Yeah. To draw two million was a big deal, and the Royals drew two million in those seasons. Um, I don't remember which year they. Well, they probably drew two million their first year in Royal Stadium in '73, and I think they did every year in year out from there on for a while, and. You really just couldn't be in that area if you were a sports fan and not hear all about the Royals. And, and they were also really good in 76. They had a lot of great players. And I just sort of picked up on that and became obsessed with the Royals. I had already liked sports history. I remember that when I was a little kid, younger than, than 10, I had a book that always stuck with me called More Strange But True Baseball Stories. And if I had a longer arm I could reach over to that shelf and grab it because I still have that book well I have I don't have that particular copy I got another one later but um so I always appreciated sports I loved playing I loved history and of course there was a lot of history to to, to to chew on but it really wasn't until we moved to Kansas City that I became obsessed with baseball and then it just sort of that was just a part of me um from from that point forward I didn't know it never occurred to me that you could make a life out of being an obsessive baseball fan. I wasn't good <laughs> at to play baseball. Um, I admired baseball writers. I idolized them to some degree, but I didn't, for whatever reason, I it never, I never made the connection between idolizing writers and actually becoming one. I didn't know how you would do that. 
So I just was sort of aimless um, for my entire youth and um, went to the University of Kansas, was there for four years, did not do well. Again, I was aimless. Uh, I told this story, various stories about those years many times, but I was a terrible student for the most part. But I was incredibly lucky because uh, in 1984, when I went to college, I happened across the Bill James Baseball Abstract in the college bookstore, was immediately captivated by it, took it home, bought it, took it home, back to my apartment, devoured it over the course of a few, a day or two, probably. And basically, <clears throat> excuse me, from that point forward, if you had asked me, what do you want to do with your life? If you could have one job in the world, what would it be? I would have said work for Bill James. I mean, quite literally, that's all I, that I thought that I might want to do. But again, there was never any connection between that desire and a path to actually do it. And if you think about it, having as your goal to work for a single person doesn't make a lot of sense because what are the chances that you would actually get to, you know, uh, it's not like you want to work for Xerox. That's a path that you can sort of lay out a lay out and say, oh yeah, if I do this, go to study this and this, interview well, maybe they'll give me, a, give me a shot. It really isn't like that with a single person, I don't think. Um, and I should mention too, right around the same time that I read the baseball abstract, almost at exactly the same moment, I also um, received, I was in something called the History Book Club back then. I received a book called Bums, An Oral History of the Brooklyn Dodgers by Peter Golombach. And again, I devoured it. Um, and I've always thought that, that what basically made me what I became was that I found these two utterly different books at exactly the same time. And it just sort of kindled this, this passion that I had for, for baseball um, and both sides of it, the history, the anecdotes, the, the wild stories, half of which probably aren't true in Golombach's book. And then this mechanical sort of analysis in Bill's books. Now, obviously the reason Bill's books were so compelling is because it wasn't cold and passionless. He also brought this this other thing to it, but I, I've always thought that sort of that sort of, and by the way, that same fall, while all this was happening, I was reading these books, the Royals were engaged in this bizarre pennant race that they wound up winning with only 84 wins. So I was obsessed with the Royals still and listening to their games every night on the radio. So all of this, that September of 1984, um, which you think about how fast a month goes by, uh, in our lives, especially as we age, but that one month in 1984 basically created the passion um, in me for all of these different things. Now, the problem is getting from having that passion to working for Bill. And another stroke of luck was that Bill happened to live about 40 miles away from me, which I wasn't aware of. But we wound up with, uh, I wound up meeting someone who had written um, in some of Bill's books. Mike Cope, who I became very, very good friends with, still am today. And, you know, fast forward four and a half years, Bill was looking for an assistant. I had dropped out of school and was roofing houses. And Mike said, Rob, Bill's looking for an assistant. You should apply. And my immediate response was the same as it's always been in my life when somebody's brought me a great opportunity. Are you crazy? That's never going to happen. Why would I do that? Um, uh, but Mike kept pestering me and I sent Bill a letter. Uh, we, he scheduled an interview and um, shockingly to me, he actually hired me um, in, called me in November of 19, would have been 1988. And I started working for Bill in, in January of, of 89 and everything sort of flowed from that moment. But if Bill hadn't hired me, my life would have been quite a bit different. I certainly would not be uh, in a room surrounded by books in Portland, Oregon, among other things. You, uh, you've had a long and winding road. And after Bill James, now you also, you went to work for ESPN, several websites, SB yes. Nation and such. Uh -huh. You wrote there, didn't you? I did. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wrote, I, I, used to say, I used to say this, put this in my, my little bios, 
um, when, when people ask me to write little bios of myself. But I wrote more words for ESPN than anyone ever had written, ultimately. Now, I'm sure somebody's passed me since then who stayed longer. But I was there for 15 years. And uh, was it 10? No, it was 10. Wait, 96. Let me think about this for a second. 96. No, it was 15. Okay, I forgot how, how long ago I started there. I started there in the spring of 96 and was there for, for an incredibly 15 years um, before moving on to SB Nation and, and Fox Sports. Um, but yeah, ESPN was great. I don't think I took full advantage of that opportunity. ESPN opens a lot of doors, which I, I nudged a few of those open. But knowing what I know now, I could have done a lot more interesting work there, done a lot more reporting, um, created more cool things. But for the most part, I was happy to just sit in my, in my, at my desk and watch baseball games and blog all day, which was, that was great. I really enjoyed that. But, but um, I, I wish I had been a little more ambitious when I was there. Well, you certainly have, have taken your talent for writing to a lot of places. You've written, what is it? Is it seven or eight books now? Uh, this, this one would make, I can as I count, this would make eight. Yes. As you count, okay. I count. Yes. <laughs> Matter of fact, we had Dale on uh, a little while ago, uh -huh. um, and he was just wonderful. He had some some, for lack of a better term, extra stories that that you folks did, you guys didn't write about, and he was just great. Here's Clayton, our chapter chair. Hi, Clayton. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Do you have a favorite book that you wrote? Do you have one that stands out the most to you throughout your career or one piece that you wrote for, say, ESPN or, or SB Nation? I would say probably um, the favorite thing that I – my favorite book is the book I did with Bill. Not, not when I was working for him, but, but, but later. Uh, we did a book <clears throat> called The Nyer James Guide to Pitchers. Mm -hmm. And – it's my favorite because I think people still now 15, no, it's probably like 18 years later, 17 years later, people still tell me that they use it. I like, I enjoy the fact that it's useful to people. Some of my books were, you know, people told me many times, oh, perfect bathroom reading. Well, that's sweet, I guess. <laughs> um, but they seem somewhat disposable and, and, and they, were, they were meant to be somewhat disposable. But the, the book about, that we did about pictures there's some work, some research in there that you still can't really find anywhere unless you want to dig through the newspaper archives online, which we didn't have, by the way, um, at, at the time when we did the research. But I just always, I really enjoyed the research for that book. I love the way it turned out with the cover. I just, I enjoy everything about it. And the fact that, um, that Bill was my co-author makes it all the more special. The favorite thing that I have written outside of the books is... Uh, when I was at, I, it, was, it was when I was at Fox Sports, uh, I came across a story somewhere, just a brief reference to the fact that Bill Murray had played professional baseball very briefly. And I poked around a little bit and I discovered that somehow no one had ever actually written about this in any depth at all. And, you know, it's, it just seems strange to me as, as famous as Bill Murray was and is that no one had ever gone to the trouble of really diving into that, that story. Uh, and I went to baseballreference.com and there he was. He's, I think he's still listed as William Murray, if anyone wants to look this up. Uh, I believe two at bats, one hit. And I became sort of obsessed about story when you're if you're going to do pieces like that and spend a lot of time it really helps if you're really curious and i really wanted to know everything i could find out uh, about that story how he came to be in uh, grace harbor washington which two hours from here um uh what was the what was the circumstance you know how did he get that 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 base hit um, was it legitimate? Was the pitcher trying? All those things. And I don't remember how I first, how I got my first entree, but once I found someone who was there, I think it was a teammate, 
Um, that just led me, as these as as happens when you do these things, to all sorts of other people. I spoke to a bunch of his teammates, his manager that 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 season. Um, uh, I think I spoke to at least one of the opponents. I don't think I was able to get to the guy who gave him gave up the hit. I don't remember why. Uh, talked to the family. Uh, talked to the to one of the bat boys from that season. I mean, they all had tremendous stories. Bill Murray, you know, famously is sort of a traveling party and everyone had their own, their favorite Bill Murray stories. So I just, I spent a few, and I went up to Grays Harbor and looked in the newspaper archives and uh, for the details and spoke to, uh, here's one. Uh, I spoke to the person who basically wrote up the scenario. It's a long story, but he was there to film something for Saturday Night Live, Bill Murray was, and they were able to fold in the actually getting him onto the roster. But I spoke to uh, Bruce. You might remember. Uh, you, you're probably too young to remember Father Guido Sarducci. No, I am not too young. I am Trump. older than I, you think I am, Rob. <laughs> and I remember Father Guido Sarducci very well. Well, his actual name is Don Novello, as you That's might right. know. And I was somehow <laughs> able to get Don Novello on the phone to talk about because he was there too for the for the, the filming that they did. So, uh, and he could not have been more gracious, telling me everything he remembered about about it so anyway that piece is still at foxsports.com they stripped out the photo i think my name is now missing they, they tell all the cool formatting is gone but if you just want to read the actual story I, it's an oral history of his season his baseball uh his baseball life basically at least his life as a player uh that summer of 19 i believe 78 it's still there and anyway that's the most fun that i've ever had working on a story oh that's terrific how did you uh how did you how long have you been a member of Sabre? Uh, I don't, this might be in my member profile. I think it is. I believe I joined in 1985. As I recall, uh, this would have been when I was going to college, but maybe spending the summer with, at my mom's place back in Kansas City. Um, as I remember it, and you know, I could be wrong about this. I, I, I am wrong. I was about to tell you a story that's not true. I learned about Sabre <laughs> in one of the baseball abstracts, probably the first one that I read. I think Bill would used to put a note in every abstract um, about Saber. That's my memory. I could, I have those right behind me. I could check. But I think I saw the note in, in one of the abstracts, either 84 or 85, sent my money off. And then shortly thereafter, I was at a baseball card show in, in uh, Kansas City. Lloyd Johnson, who was the director for some years uh, in the 80s. I think maybe even in the 90s, I could be wrong about that. He had a table set up where he was recruiting, but he also had a bunch of Saber journals there, uh, older ones. And I just struck up a conversation and he could not have been kinder. He gave me a bunch of Saber journals. So that sort of jump started my Saber publication collection. Um, and uh, I've been, I think I might've lapsed for a few months at some point, but I've been a member ever since. So I think it was 1985. So well, that leads me to... And by the way, I used to tell people I was the youngest member in Sabre. Um, that hasn't been true for a long time, but I did enjoy <laughs> it while it lasted. Well, well that, leads... <laughs> that leads me to Sabrecast. Mm -hmm. Tell me how Sabrecast came about. You've done this now for, I think, three years. And there, there's a... There's a, a wonderful format that I stole when we opened up our, our talk this evening. And I, 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 I know I blatantly did that on you, but that's okay. Uh, um, how did Sabercast come about? Did that come about through Scott Bush, through, through an initiative of the board? What, what led to, to you getting, doing it? Well, Bruce, I try not to ask too many questions. I see. Uh, because... I might find out that I was the third choice. Uh, I might find out there was a fight and somebody said Rob would be terrible. So um, I just sort of take things as they come along. But it's funny because uh, I remember, I don't remember if it was the same day or not, but in my mind, these are sort of all get conflated. Um, I had a few nice phone conversations over the course of, uh, it seems like a few days, maybe it was a few weeks. Um, I feel like, there was a pretty, uh, uh, it was a, there was a pretty short amount of time between the call when Scott told me that I was going to be receiving a Chadwick award 
and the time Scott said, would you like to do a podcast? And maybe even the time when I got the call from uh, about winning the Casey Award for, for, for my previous book, they didn't all happen within the same week, but I feel like there was a lot of good news there. And frankly, it was just nice to be asked to do the podcast. I had done a podcast when I was at Fox Sports. I enjoyed it. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as I probably could have. I don't think we had a great format. And then the way my job at Fox ended was um, not super pleasant. So I don't associate a lot of great memories with, with that podcast. But uh, when I spoke to Scott about the podcast, this podcast, the Sab Sabercast, he, he basically gave me carte blanche to have people on who I thought were interesting. And, um, and also, I, uh, you know, having been a member for so long, the chance to promote Saber to uh, one of the first things I did was make a list of Saber members who I thought would be could be potential guests or good guests. Um, so now, uh, not to, to make it sound like an act of charity, um, I do receive a monthly check uh, for doing the podcast. It's not a, it's not a lot of money, but it's definitely makes it uh, worth doing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not a, uh, I don't think of it as a favor that I'm doing for Sabre, but it is gratifying for me to do something that helps promote Sabre. That's an important thing to me because I mentioned, I talked a, a little bit about, about this at the Chadwick Award ceremony a few years ago, but, uh, you know, I would say that in terms of how my career has progressed and all the things, good things that have happened, you know, Bill V number one. Uh, my mother, who instilled in me a great love of books and reading and, and supported me when I was, uh, you know, when I, we always had a lot of books around the, around the, around the house. Um, but aside from Bill and my mom, I give probably Sabrudy number three on that list of, of important, um, important influences in my career, support. Um, I've made so many great friends that I have to this day. Through Saber, uh, all of my research efforts, of course, have been tied to Saber one way or the other. So, so it's 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 very gratifying to be associated in a meaningful way like this. Could be other ways. Um, if I didn't have this, I'd probably try to do some more writing for the journals or the bio project and whatnot. But um, I think I'm I need to have some connection where I feel like I'm helping the organization in some way, and and uh, it's hard for me to imagine a better one than the podcast. Well, it's a terrific podcast and it, there, there, it's a great format where it's just a conversation between you and the guest. And to at least what I'm listening to me, it sounds like you could be in, a, in, in his or her living room, kicking back with something to drink and, and, and just talking. You're the, the mo one of the most recent podcasts that you put out with a, uh, uh, Jimmy Linetti from uh, uh, St. Paul, who repairs gloves. Mm -hmm. That was terrific. Just a wonderful conversation. If you're not listening to Sabercast, guys and gals, uh, go to uh, saber.org and and have a listen to, to Rob's podcast. I think you're really going to enjoy that. One of the other things that Rob does, now tell us how you became the commissioner of the West Coast Collegiate League. Well, again, a situation where I don't ask too many questions. <laughs> I, honestly, I honestly don't really know exactly how it happened. Um, here's what I think happened. This goes back to the winter, I believe, of 27, 2017, 2018. Um, I'll, and I'll give you a little uh, – I, I, I mentioned that I've been blessed – over the years and been very lucky to do the things that I do and have the opportunities that I've had. And I'm quite cognizant of how, how, how much good fortune I have enjoyed. I was, there's a local group here in Portland called the old timers baseball association. And they throw a banquet every winter. Uh, they'll usually get a major leaguer in to give a little talk and then one or two other baseball figures um, while everyone's eating their rubber chicken. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I had been invited a few years earlier to give a little talk, which I did. Um, and in 
I believe it was January or February of 2018, they invited me back. And I said, sure, happy to do it. Spent many hours writing an, a, a brand new talk about baseball history, essentially. Uh, baseball as our national pastime and tried to make the case that Sure, it might not get the ratings that the, that the NFL does, but in many ways, it is still the national pastime because it still sort of permeates our culture. That was sort of the, the thesis anyway. Well, I have an aversion to public speaking, like most of us do. And I think subconsciously, I was absolutely did not want to go to this thing and give this talk. And I think that I was uh, that I had an aversion to it because I completely forgot about the whole thing, the day that I was supposed to go give the the talk. Um, that sounds like it's almost impossible, right? You spent many hours working on this speech. It's always in your head. I got to finish. I got to got to revise the speech. Revise the speech. The day of the speech, I went to a coffee shop to fool around, basically, and I was just sitting there at 4 30 in the afternoon and a friend of mine who was going to this thing texted me and said do you want to ride and i was like oh yeah that's today i'm supposed to be at this in two hours and i'm dressed in a t-shirt which i am now and shorts and it wasn't shorts it was winter but uh sitting at a coffee shop reading whatever i was doing um and of course i panicked a little bit i had not revised the speech so i wasn't really ready but long story short i did get there um, I did give the talk. Someone who runs one of the teams in the West Coast League was at the banquet. And for whatever reason, he thought that I might be a good fit. They had just um, lost through whatever circumstances they're the president of the league. They'd gone through two or three presidents over the last two or three years. And they were looking for um, a commissioner, someone to just come in as it was described to me and not really do anything maybe handle a couple of uh, disciplinary issues over the course of the season. You know, a manager gets ejected. You have to decide if he's suspended. I think he told me that maybe two or three times over the course of the season, I might need to render some decision. Well, it turned out to be a lot more than that. And if anybody's interested in uh, how that first season went for me, you can hear the very worst of it on the first episode of Michael Lewis's podcast, the name of which escapes me at the, at the moment, but um, um, I know Michael Lewis a little bit. He's the author of Moneyball for the few out there who don't aren't familiar with, the, familiar with his work. But um, I was with him that summer at an event in Washington, D.C., a baseball thing. And a call came in. I had to deal with that. And so I was complaining. And, and uh, when he started his podcast a few months later, he thought I would make a good guest for the first episode. But it did, I don't come off very well because I was, frankly, overwhelmed that first summer. Um, and I just sort of slowly grown into the job. Uh, but there was, there was no reason for anyone to think that I would be any good at this job. And it, uh, I, it's, it's, it's semi-miraculous that I'm still here uh, four and a half years later. <laughs> How big is the league now? We have 16 teams and we are the, the, we are the most far-flung baseball league. I believe outside of maybe AAA, we have a team in, we have a team in, uh, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, and we have teams in Central Oregon and uh, and the Willamette Valley. So I think it's if you were going to ride a bus, it would be about a twenty four hour bus ride from Oof. from uh, uh, Springfield, Oregon to to Edmonton. Oof! Wow how now how how successful was this past season for you? Um, you know there are different metrics. The what metric I would yeah. look at in the long term. It's how many players did we have this season who wound up getting drafted? But we're not going to know that for two or three or four years. Um, we had some fantastic attendance. There were a lot of teams bounced back in a big way from the attendance downturn. Um, and honestly, last year, some of our teams did really well um, after missing a whole season because nobody played in 2020. Um, and the biggest uh, – for us, the thing that happened this year that was – was a real bright spot was um we had uh four new teams we went from 12 to 16 so those were all new and we also had two other teams uh, uh in canada that couldn't play even last year so we only had 10 teams in the league 
pl actually playing a year ago. <laughs> um, uh, so we basically went from 10 teams last year to 16 this year and everything, you know, we didn't have any major issues. We didn't lose any games to wildfire smoke, which was um, pretty surprising given the previous seasons. Um, as, as awful as it was in many parts of the country, uh, we actually had a relatively cool smoke-free summer, which I, I don't expect will happen again. Um, I, I thought about every day how lucky we were that we didn't, weren't losing any games to heat or smoke. Um, we had to start a few games an hour later after the sun went down because it was so hot and say uh, where, you know, Walla Walla or some wherever else that, that happened, but Yakima that happened when you get on the other side of the mountains from where I am in Portland, uh, the heat can just be devastating until the sun mm -hmm. goes down at seven thirty or eight o'clock. But, but, uh, all things considered, it was a fantastic season. That's terrific. Yeah, you've, you've spoken about the West coast league a couple of times on the podcast and mm -hmm. I've had a chance to, uh, take a look at the website. I urge everybody here to, uh, look it up and see just, just how great this league is. It's, it's a, a really great thing out on the West coast. Yeah. And we play in a lot of great old ballparks, including yeah. some old uh, Northwest league parks. I can't remember how many of our parks were Northwest league parks. At least I can think of three just off the top of my head, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be more like four or five. Um, some beautiful old ballparks. Uh, we have stadiums, you know, the stadium in Port Angeles has a view of, uh, of of olympic national park off in the distance uh, i mean uh, and you're right on the water in some of our some of our stadiums so yeah it really is for people who uh want to go on a baseball trip and i know we all fantasize about about those um it's pretty hard to beat the northwest in june and july i'll bet i'll bet What's next for Rob Nyer, though? What's what 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 what's what's the future hold for 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 your writing, your podcasting? What what's next? Well, I hope the podcast keeps steaming along. I my goal at the moment is get to episode two hundred, and then I'll see if Scott still wants me to hang around. Uh, we're only twenty away now, so um, I hope to make it. Uh, you know, that would be nice to make it through. What, that would be what uh, four years basically. Um, uh, and we never run out of guests, so that's never going to be a problem. I want to keep doing that. I really enjoy it. Um, I do need another project, uh, writing project of some sort. I, I have a tough time getting motivated unless, um, and this is, this is, I'm embarrassed by this, but I mean, I've been working on two different stories for the Sabres baseball cards blog for like three years and I just can't seem to get motivated and I don't really know why, but I think I need, I shouldn't say I need, I do a lot better when um, I've got a, an actual deadline. Um, and right now I don't have anything planned every year. I, I think I'm going to have a new book project to work on during the winter. Um, last winter, I was sort of putting the finishing touches on this book, although it didn't take a lot of work by then, but I don't have any excuses this winter. So um, I really need to have a project, um, because I don't really feel unless I have a reason to, to sit down with a pad and write, um, I, I feel like I'm, you know, what else are you going to do? Are you going to watch TV or I could happily read, uh, read a book that somebody else wrote every day. But at the end of the day, I would wonder why I didn't write my own. So, um, so we'll see, but no, nothing, nothing planned. If anybody's got a good idea and something that will sell ideally, um, I'm all ears. Well, geez, before I open it up to questions for everybody else, I may as well ask the next question, which is the natural next question that, that would come toward the end of, of your podcast, which would come from Scott Bush. What's Rob reading? <laughs> uh, well, as I mentioned, I wonder if I have it sitting here. Now I took it inside. Um, I just started Tyler Kepner's new book about the World Series. And, you know, it's yes. great. Everything Tyler writes whether it's for the times or his, his last book K uh, about pitching and pitches. Um, Tyler's fantastic. And he's been a guest on the show twice and he'll be on again, I think in a couple of weeks to talk about the new book, but uh, yeah, that'll keep me busy for the next week or so. And I started reading the new Stephen King novel as well. Huh. Um, I'm actually in the middle of probably nine books right now, which is a little excessive even for me. Um, <laughs> I need to get a handle on things. 
Oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. I, I'm one at, I'm a one at a time guy. But. It's that's much better. You can focus, but uh, yeah. I just can't seem to. I'll see one sitting there next to me and think, I just want to dip in a little bit, and and then I'm in. Then I'm. Then it's I'm, that's on the list too. So, but those are the two main ones right now. Well, why don't we open up the questions to from everyone here? So, Rob, this is Ken Edwards. Uh, you and I met once before at a Sunday brunch with Mark and Caroline Bone. Okay, nice. In, uh, in Portland. Here in Portland, so uh-huh. Yes, it's nice to see you again. You and I have, a, I have a nice autograph uh, copy of Powerball next oh, to me. Excellent. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm actually curious about how you would compare the baseball appreciation cultures between ESPN that had Buster Olney and it had Peter Gammons, um, et cetera, with Fox Sports and SB. I'm, I'm interested in your different, the, the cultural experiences between those three organizations that, that you had and how you would compare them. Because they, be, they have to be different, or I suspect that they're different. And, and I'd love to hear your perspectives from a, from a professional perspective. Boy, uh, I would have to really think about that to, to give a decent, a better than cursory answer. What I can tell you about is my experience there. I mean, ESPN, when I started, uh, it was, their goal was to basically take over sports coverage on the internet. Um, and so they hired like right out of the gate. This is probably even before I started. And I started within eight months or a year from when the website opened back then, as you might recall, it was called ESPN net sports zone mm -hmm. for some reason, yep. Uh, yep. basically ESPN. They didn't, they weren't sure about this internet thing. So they didn't just want to say ESPN. They wanted to have that. They wanted to have this weird separation between the website and the TV network. Now that went away within a few years. Um, but what they did, I think, even before I started, was they went out and hired a bunch of really good writers. They, uh, Jason Stark, Gammons, obviously, was the big one. Um, I'm trying to think who else started. Uh, only came in a few years later. But they were really aggressive about locking up a bunch of really good national uh, writers. And, of course, baseball at that point, when I started in 96 and for years after, was, was um, all over the network. I don't know. It, they probably had baseball on three or four nights every week. Yeah, right. It was a big deal. Um, now I mentioned the advantage. I didn't. I not taking advantage of that. I, I really didn't um, get immersed in the sort of national baseball coverage in a way that I probably could have. Part of it was that they had all these guys who were pros at reporting. And they leaned on them and they, I wasn't one of those guys. So it would have been difficult to really, but I, I should have worked harder at it. Um, but certainly there was, there was a real culture of, of baseball coverage there. Um, they put a real commitment into making our stats pages really cool, giving the people who worked at the website, not just me, but people I worked with, uh, basically creating you know, we didn't have baseballreference.com. We couldn't get that commitment to build that sort of database. We did some really cool stuff. We were the first ones, I think, who ever put, and it seems so fundamental now or simplistic, run differential, right? That's everywhere now. But, but we were the first people who ever put run differential on the web. Um, and it seems like such a simple thing, but nobody had that kind of thing. Um, mostly we had one guy who worked on the programming side or the data side who, who put a lot of extra work in to create really cool stats packages. So we had the best team stats. We had the best player pages. Uh, there was just a real commitment to yes, baseball, because we had so much baseball coverage. And also there was a commitment to baseball fans who worked there, the ability to, to just go out and create things. So, and I don't, know that it's like that anymore um i haven't felt any real connection to espn since i left honestly um part of that's just defense mechanisms part of it is their baseball coverage isn't as good as it as it was then um, that's true 
SB Nation was next. It was a whole different model. When I was at, at ESPN, they came to me and said, my bosses came to me and said, we want to create a blog network, but we can't pay anybody to do it or you. Just, we want you to do this thing. And I'm like, okay, I'll try. Um, and we got some, we got it. We, we weren't able to get all 30 teams covered with the team blogs. We did get some good writers, um, some of whom were still out there blogging. Uh, but there wasn't a real commitment to sort of creating this new world of baseball coverage with team blogs and non-professionals. There was always this idea that uh, I always sort of felt, and this is again might be my 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 uh, insecurity speaking, but I always felt like if you didn't come up through newspapers, you were a second-class citizen at at ESPN. All the editors there came out of newspapers. Um, and, uh, they just, I didn't think they ever really got the internet in a way that would allow them to be really creative and, and do basically what SB Nation wound up doing, creating high quality blogs for hundreds of different sports teams, including all the major league teams. You know, we had writers when I was at SB Nation blogs who were just as good as anyone you'd find anywhere. Grant Brisby is one great example, I, you know, I, um, who I worked with. Um, so it was a different model. Um, I don't think you'd ever choose the blogs over the stuff at ESPN, but I think that they all sort of, ha you, you wanted both by that point. And then Fox, we made a real commitment to baseball, created this new website that I was in charge of called Just a Bit Outside. And um, about a year into it, uh, because of, uh, those famously faked metrics you might have heard uh, heard about. Um, everybody decided we need to stop creating content, a written content, and make videos. So I've got there's videos out there somewhere, maybe still of me, um, person in front of my laptop, making six minute videos about this and that. Um, uh, those didn't really do anything, and ultimately my little my little website that was around for about a year and a half went away because we just didn't draw enough of an audience. And I always thought part of that was because I didn't do a good enough job with it. And part was that the TV network never promoted it at all. Um, we got no support from Fox. And in fact, shortly after that, they basically pivoted to having zero written content and going just with videos. And now I think they've pivoted back. They've hired some old ESPN staffers to come in and create Ooh. written content again. Um, but I think there it really wasn't that they didn't care about baseball. It was they didn't care about anything that wasn't video and quick. Um, they did have good baseball people there. Ken Rosenthal obviously um, has a tremendous reputation and has done great work for decades. And I, I really enjoyed getting to know Ken and working with him. Um, so there's not any running theme through any of that. It's just sort of how the business has gone. And it would have those things all probably would have happened regardless of, of where it was, just based on the context of the times and what people thought was going to be successful. That's great. Thank you. Mark very and long Carol answer. Sorry. That's all right. No, that's very interesting. Mark and Caroline send their best. <laughs> I appreciate that. I just Bruce. sent them a postcard. Okay. Bruce, back to you. Who else has uh, questions for our guest, Rob Nyer? Oh, Don't Rob, be shy, first, kids. Rob, hey, Rob th thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, you bet. I wanted to ask just about, about when you're working on a book, what is your research and writing process like? It, I would say it, it is, everyone's different. I'll, I'll, I will tell you the last two uh, because really the last two are the first two that I've written when I had decent access to online newspapers. Um, all my other books were written basically using microfilm when I needed to do some research. Uh, uh, and of course, baseballreference.com. But with the, the, um, with Powerball, I knew that I wanted to tell the story of this, whatever baseball is like in, then it was, I think, 2017. Um, and so I made a list of what, I don't remember what the number was, 24, 25, 30 different topics I knew I wanted to hit on, whether for a paragraph or a page or five pages. And when, once I had that list, then I watched the particular game that I was focusing on over and over again, 
just picking out spots in the game where I could touch on that subject. Um, as some of you, I'm sure know, uh, Powerball was basically an updated version of a book called um, Nine Innings that Dan Oakert wrote back in the 80s. Uh, Dan's book was, was researched much differently than mine. Dan spent, I think it was four years, maybe longer, working on that book, um, partly because there was the baseball strikes they put off for a year. Um, but basically, he really did spend three or four years just working on that book. In fact, I think the book came out two years after the game that it's about. Whereas my book, um, I didn't get a contract until August of 2017. And the book had to be out in the fall of 2018. So I had a very compressed schedule. So there wasn't a lot of heavy reporting. I was able to do, make some phone calls, um, talk to some people. I did go down to spring training um, the next spring after the game that I was writing about. Spent an afternoon or two afternoons, well, a couple hours um, in the A's clubhouse. And then shortly after that, I went up to Seattle and spent some time again, a couple of afternoons in the um, talking to the Astros in the visiting clubhouse. So I did, did get some of that first person stuff that, that Dan got in his book, but for the most part, it was picking these subjects and then going out and looking for sources, whether it's online or in books, whatever it is. And, you know, there's a whole section about uh, the shift, the infield shift and the history of that. Well, I have a hundred books that talk about Ted Williams and the shift and Lou Boudreau and all that stuff. So most of it was done just with my, with my, with my library. Now with the book I did with Dale Scott, people might say, well, you didn't do any work on that book. You just had to listen to Dale talk, which is to some degree true. But again, I made a list at the beginning of things that I wanted Dale to talk about. Um, and I knew what some of those were gonna be just from having spoken to him just in conversation, knowing what, what, what he was passionate about, uh, what he had good stories about. But I also, uh, you know, I think I own basically every book ever written by an umpire or about umpires. So I re basically read or reread almost all of those books and just kept a list of things that could be fun to have in Dale's book. And we went getting through most of those, um, not all of them by any means, but definitely most of them. We talked about, I would bring it up and say, sometimes I'd say Dale, I read on page 100 and whatever of, of uh, Ron Luciano's book X. And let's talk about that from your perspective. But for the most part, I just would ask him a question about umpire and it was inspired by something I'd read in another book. But I am, you know, you can be paralyzed by research and it can be an excuse not to work, but I need to have at least a base of research, not an outline per se, but in something in my head or a list on paper of things that, that I wanna know more about, and then just take it from there. But the research I really enjoy, the writing not as much, but the writing's fun too. What else for Rob? I've got a quick one. It's kind of silly in Powerball when you did the research on Powerball and how many mm -hmm. times have you received this question? Did you ever have a hint of the trash can controversy? I did not. And I think there's a short section on science ceiling in there, right? Because correct. Uh, I believe this was after the Red Sox Apple watch thing had happened. Yep. And I think I touched a little bit, you know, in, on the history of, that sort of things, but no, 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 I had zero hint. Um, and I, I have wondered, you know, in the wake of all that that's happened since, I wondered if there was a point at which I might have have become skeptical of the Astros or thought maybe they were cheating. But yeah, I don't know who I would have asked, even if I had a suspicion. You know, I, I was on a first name basis with Jeff Luno and still am with Sig Maidal. Um, one thing that I've never been really good at is asking someone a question when I think I already know what the answer is going to be. Um, and, you know, based on what we've heard since then, I think that if I had said, hey, do you guys cheat? They could have reasonably said, <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I think they, from what I understand, they weren't really aware of what was going on now. But even if they had been aware, they weren't going to tell me. So then I put them in a position of having to lie to me, which I, I'm not fond of doing. Um, so I don't know who I would have talked to. What 
if I had been smarter about it and thought about it harder, um, maybe I could have asked some people I know who work in baseball. Hey, if you were going to cheat in 2017 and you weren't going to use an Apple watch, because we already know about that one. What are some, I, some ways that you might do that? And of course there, there has been a history as we all know now, um, there's a history of teams using TV monitors going back to the 1960s and 70s to cheat. Um, I wasn't aware of that history then, I don't think. Um, but you know, now having read this book, which everyone, I recommend to everyone, um, I, I have a, a much better, if I had read this book before mine, and this didn't have the Astro stuff, I might've had some, 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 at least some, uh, some thoughts on how one might cheat with modern technology, but it didn't even occur to me. I don't think I had a single thought about the Astros cheating. Um, even though in retrospect, if you're going to pick one team to cheat, it would have been them because they were ahead of the curve everywhere else. Why not that too? Thank you. That's great. Sure. Intentional uh, Block is a new book that just came out by Dan Levitt and Mark Armour. Uh, also, Saber members. This is, this is a great book, too, about um, cheating in the game. Grab that book, too. It's, 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 it's fantastic. But what else do we have for Rob? I, I will mention in passing, since it hasn't come up, um, uh, I sort of complained about my, my, my job as commissioner in the first season, but I should mention that it, there, uh, it's one of those jobs where you can't even really imagine what it's like until you have it, and there aren't very many of them out there. And I, I feel very blessed to have had the chance to do this. Um, among the cool things are getting to go to all the ballparks I don't go to each ballpark every season. We have too many ballparks now, but I have been to all of them. Um, visited cities that I that I had not never had a chance to visit before: Edmonton, Kelowna, British Columbia. Um, um, that's fantastic. I've gotten to put the mask a mascot costume on a couple of times, which I really loved. Um, my name's on the baseball, which is, that is cool. the coolest thing pretty much <laughs> you could ever happen to somebody who loves baseball. And how do I get one of those? That's not uh, I, I have sent them out. It, um, I think I charge five dollars per ball to cover my shipping costs. So, um, uh, yeah, when I when, the, when I first got my name on the ball, um, I had many many requests from friends and family. It has quite a download, but I guess they're I guess they're not impressed by that anymore. Or they've preserved the ball in lucite cases and don't need another one. <laughs> Well, I think if we don't have much else for Rob, uh, I just want to say thank you very much, my friend, for doing this. This has been terrific. Just terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so well, much. Well, it's always my pleasure. I really appreciate speaking to anyone, but especially Sabre people. So thanks for, for having me. Well, I really appreciate you accepting our invitation. And uh, everybody, Rob Nyer, fellow Sabre member and one of the most terrific authors we have, a a podcaster and and has a litany of credits to his name as well he should thank you very much for 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 coming in tonight rob it's been a pleasure Thanks, everybody appreciate it thank you rob thank you, thank you rob. have a great night <laughs>